lip. And, uh, Maxine's known for almost uh, four years about her leukemia. She's been Dr. very fortunate. The majority of that time, the disease has been a remission. But a time is now running out, and her doctors advised her to take quick action. That action is a bone marrow transplant operation. It's a dangerous operation, but Maxine's chances are better than most because of Kathy, her twin sister. Uh, I came down to the wire where uh, it could come out at any time, and uh, with a uh, twin sister whose uh, HLA factor and other factors completely match and were completely identical, uh, we believe this is uh, the cure. Maxine and Kathy will be flying to Seattle, Washington Sunday for the operation. Their extensive chemotherapy and radiation treatments will kill the cancerous cells in Maxine's body. At that point, a portion of Kathy's bone marrow will be transplanted to her twin sister, giving her healthy cells. The total treatment will take between four and seven weeks and will cost more than $50,000. Uh, it's costing a lot of money, and uh, we need help for uh, transportation there, or plane fare, and we just, uh, it's, it's life-saving, and we just, we just need help uh, in many other areas. If there's any way you can help Maxine and her sister, contact them at 348-8327. Any support, whether monetary or just plain good wishes, will be appreciated. Sherry Sellers, Action 4. school board decided to put children first instead of money when it decided last night not to close Willard and Field Elementary Schools. The original plan had been to consolidate the two schools into a new building. A new school was to be built at McKinley Park, but that idea met a lot of opposition from homeowners in the area. The residents at McKinley Park were concerned the new school would ruin their neighborhood and the park as well. But now that the school board has decided to leave McKinley Park alone and build two new schools at Willard and Field, the homeowners are happy. Well, we're indeed happy about it. The people's homes have been saved and our park has been saved. It was a bad location for a school because of the flooding problem. And we're just very happy that it has been changed. So Willard Elementary School will be torn down and replaced at a cost of $1.6 million. And there will be a new field elementary school that will house 350 students at a cost of $1.8 million. That means the students can stay right where they are, but in completely new schools. Bella Shaw, Action 4. If you're not registered, you can't vote. So contact your county election board and register now. And be sure to vote for Paramutual Horse Racing, September 21st. Commercials for and against state question 553 are apparently getting the word out. The message that's coming across loud and clear at this office is let's vote. To these workers, it seems like the phones haven't stopped ringing since registration started. Well, let's be sure to get her registered. The questions differ, but the subject is the same. State question 553 on paramutual racing. The interest in the hot controversy has drummed up an incredible increase in new voter registration. Between 750 and 1,000 people a day are placing their names on the list of qualified voters. Heavily steady. Robert Dennis of the County Election Board feels the jump means good voter turnout on the 21st. He has some tips to make the wait worthwhile if lines do get long. We urge the voter to look at the sample ballot, to familiarize themselves with what is on their ballot, so that when they walk into the voting machine and pull the red handle, that they'll, they'll be familiar with what it is, in fact, that uh, confronts them as a voter, the issues that they will be able to participate in. Workers at the election board hope the new voters registering aren't just one issue, one time voters. As Dennis puts it, it's a privilege for life. Sherry Sellers, action for the county election board. The inspector's first stop was Star Elementary School. 
the site where tragedy struck last year when a hot water heater exploded. That's the reason for the inspections, to prevent another such tragedy. The inspectors checked the new six-gallon unit at Star, and this time the report was an A+. Inspectors say the new unit is problem-free. It was installed properly. It's got the proper size, temperature, and pressure relief valve on it. Chief Inspector Greenwald says the children at Star are safe from this water heater exploding. But what about water heaters at other schools? Are other children in danger? Uh, no, I don't think there's any need for any parent to, to, to be overly concerned to the point of where they're apprehensive about sending their child for school to the schools. But there's, there's, until we've done our job, I have some concern. While Star Elementary was a top priority, the inspection didn't stop there. Safety officials later came to John Marshall High School. Inspectors checked five water heaters at John Marshall and all passed the test. There's a tough checklist. If any part of the heater doesn't check out, the unit is shut down until the part can be fixed or replaced. The inspecting began today, but it will be months before every school has been checked. The Commissioner of Labor has said we will inspect schools first. This is just a priority item that he has designated that we will do first. So when we are completed with the schools, well, we'll just pick up the ball again and start hitting the cities and the uh, county and state facilities. So we're just hitting the, uh, more or less the first go around on these inspections, at least in the schools. March is the target date for having safety approved water heaters in each state school. Debbie Mash, Action 4, John Marshall High School. If you're traveling down Interstate 35 tomorrow morning on your way to the Oklahoma-West Virginia football game and you find the interstate a little bit congested, there are alternate routes to take to make that trip go much faster. We're asking motors coming from the east to take Interstate I-240 to Sunny Lane and then south on Sunny Lane into Norman. Motors coming from the west to take I-240 to US-62 south to State Highway 9 and then into Norman. This will avoid a lot of the congestion on Interstate 35. It's also very important that people avoid the I-240 and Shields area because of the construction there, which is going to back up traffic considerably. Traffic has not been as congested over the last few years as it was before, and the reason, according to the Highway Patrol, is that the fans who travel these roads have season tickets and go to all the games every year, thus becoming familiar with the shortcuts. Maybe the biggest problem for motorists will be finding a place to park near the stadium. But as always, by kickoff, there will be over 70,000 Sooner fans in Owen Stadium tomorrow, having battled the roads and parking hassles, ready for another year of Big Red football. Kevin Ogle, Action 4. Perhaps it was President Reagan's own brush with crime in the March of 1981 assassination attempt by John Hinckley Jr. that prompted him to recommend a Criminal Justice Reform Act. The act would basically do three things. It would limit the defense of insanity, make it easier for police to obtain evidence, and make it harder to appeal cases to the federal courts. There is little chance Congress will act on the measure before adjourning. But District Attorney Bob Macy is all for it. He thinks the president is reacting to an overall concern from the public that crime is getting out of hand. If you go out uh, and talk to people here in Oklahoma City, they're all deathly afraid of crime, especially uh, elderly persons who live by themselves, don't even want to answer their doors after dark because they're afraid of crime. In Oklahoma County, we're still having over a thousand burglaries a month. But the measure raises some serious constitutional questions about a defendant's rights. An Oklahoma County public defender has some questions about policemen being able to obtain evidence. So I would hate for uh, the police to have an unlimited right to go into your house or my house, knock down the door and search through everything and looking for stolen property or looking for drugs when they have no basis, no probable cause to do it. And if we don't have some type of law that protects the citizens, such as you and me, uh, from police uh, unenforcement of rights, then I think we could uh, come to a, a lawless society the other way. Bella Shaw, Action 4 at the Oklahoma County Courthouse.
Just go down the Broadway extension in Edmond. You can see a stream of fast food restaurants. Many of them are hiring new employees. Why? Because many of the daytime employees were students. And with school starting again, the restaurants are looking for new daytime employees to replace them. Edmond is a university town, and the fall is usually a time when business picks up for fast food places in Edmond. There are jobs out there, and restaurant managers are willing and ready to hire new people. Just driving through Oklahoma City, you don't have to look very far to find a job in the fast food business. You can just look for the signs out front, and even if it's a fast food business with no sign, I would imagine that if you go in, you're clean cut, you have a nice attitude, nice personality, you're probably going to be put to work pretty quick. Also, Martin says fast food restaurants usually stay open longer hours, thus giving people more opportunity to find work. So there are jobs out there, but you can't be picky. You have to be willing to work at a fast food restaurant for a little more than minimum wage. But at least you'll have a job, and that's something a lot of people can't say right now. Bella Shaw, Action 4 in Edmond. More than 16,000 Oklahoma City children depend on the school bus to get them to class every day. With that kind of number, safety isn't a word that comes directly to mind. But in actual fact, safety starts here with the kids. School rules concerning behavior on the bus are stressed to each student. Things like staying in your seat or keeping all fingers and heads out of the windows. They know a broken rule can mean injury to themselves and possibly to their friends but the responsibility of safety by no means lies entirely on their shoulders. It's the school bus driver who has the greatest responsibility. Each has to carry their precious cargo through Oklahoma City streets under all kinds of weather conditions with all kinds of distractions. That tough job gets even harder when other drivers on the road ignore the laws of safety. Two small children have already been hurt this year because impatient drivers continue to pass stop school buses. I got off the bus and then I went behind the bus and I started walking across the street and all of a sudden, wow, the lights went out for a couple seconds, laying on the ground. What was the reaction of the driver after it happened? He got up and went over and helped me. Up. The woman, she was scared too. They helped me up. That one girl, she said, you'll be okay, you'll be okay, you know, like that. She kept on saying that. Ten-year-old Chris was okay, but what if he wasn't? What if he was your child? We all have a responsibility when it comes to school bus safety. Sherry Sellers, Action 4. Oh, approximately uh, every two or three months, uh, we'll put an undercover officer, female officer, on the street in the in the areas where we have high complaints of prostitution. The Oklahoma County Sheriff's Office under J.D. Sharp budgeted money to upgrade the county's jail medical program. It's now the finest in the state, with a fraction of the money spent by other state cities of comparable size. Captain Russell Deere has been with the department for years, and he's seen the progress. Well, our facility, I think now, compared to what it was back a few years ago, is compared to a lot better. I know several of the other surrounding counties do not have any medical staff at all, which we have a medical staff, as I said before, uh, is on call 24 hours a day, and generally is here anywhere from 8 to 10, 12 hours a day, taking care of inmates is here. Our population in the jail right now is approximately around 500. And with this many inmates, you, you always have, uh, you know, 20 or 30 people a day that need medical attention in some, some sort. Dr. Don Chumley has the contract with the county to provide medical services. Compared to Jacksonville, Florida and Duval County, about Oklahoma City size, Oklahoma County taxpayers are getting a heck of a deal. In comparison 
to Duval County Jail, which has a staff of approximately 28, we have a staff of approximately three. We render the same medical care as Duval County Jail. What it is costing us is time. We are working 14 to 16 hours a day, seven days a week, plus we are on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Other state county jails budget monies for prison medical care, but doctors don't make daily rounds. And for instance, in most counties, a doctor is on call in emergency situations only. Yes, health care is improving, and for those sensitive to prisoners' needs, take heart. The Oklahoma County Jail is setting a pace that others may soon follow. I guess I just want to thank you. I'd like to welcome you back to work, and I'd like to thank you for your part in keeping my job and your jobs, okay? It was time for motivation and inspiration in the Oklahoma City GM plant today. 2,200 workers of the first shift were back assembling the Chevrolet Celebrity and Citation. The workers had been laid off for over a month because of slow sales and retooling for the 1983 models. One of the items on the day's agenda at the plant was the orientation speech. Plant officials told their employees that there was no guarantee that the road to recovery would not include further layoffs. There is that possibility. But most at the plant feel they are relatively secure with GM. Besides that, there are not many other alternatives. Did you have a hard time finding work after you were laid off first time here? Uh, yes. Matter of fact, I didn't find any after I was laid off first time. This last time I worked a little bit for my brother-in-law, but other than that, Oh, it's kind of a spooky deal, but uh, where else are you going to find a job now? With the workers back on the job, a certain amount of optimism is being expressed by some of the top officials at the GM plant. Basically, I guess, you know, things have got to uh, improve. I mean, uh, we've been in such a slump for, for so long now, and uh, there are some signs the interest rate is starting to come down, and the other uh, business indicators are looking a little better. and. Uh, people just you know, are going to have to buy cars sooner or later. So for the time being, it's full steam ahead. There will be two more downtimes in October and November. But other than that, the first shift employees will be back on the assembly line, producing the car GM hopes will lead them out of economic trouble. Kevin Ogle, Action 4. This year, drunk drivers in Oklahoma will kill nearly 500 people and seriously injure another 10,000. Nationwide, 26,000 people will die because of a drunk driver. Those statistics, those deaths, have these people worried. They're members of RIT, Remove Intoxicated Drivers. Drunk driving is the first cause of death for everyone after cancer. We don't know what to do about cancer. We do know what to do about drunk driving. We have the technological solutions, but we can't use them because politically it's not convenient. So we have to make it convenient for our legislators, our judges, our district attorneys. 
and Oklahoma lawmakers were among those attending tonight's meeting. RID members want laws mandating breathalyzer tests. They want plea bargaining for drunk drivers eliminated. And they've asked police forces to set up random road checks. How effective this program is and others like it may show in next year's traffic fatality statistics. Debbie Mash, Action 4 at Oscar Rose Junior College. Memberships bring in about 35 to 39 percent of AMCARE's capital and operating revenue. We're a public trust, so we're funded primarily by fee-for-service and our membership fees. So, of course, it's very important for us to make our goal in order to have that percentage of our budget. It's not going to affect us in the long run because of the fact that the commodities that the American railroads haul today are lumbers, grain, uh, steel, things of this nature that we can't haul because of the weight limits on the highway and, and under the ICC ruling, you know, the amount of weight that we can haul. They're maintaining bulk freight and it's such cheap freight that the American trucker cannot maintain at the price of the economy today. We get Earlier this year, Mass Trans tried to accommodate Oklahoma City bus riders by moving the transfer site to Broadway downtown. Surveys had determined this was the best spot to have all the buses meet. But downtown businesses complained the buses were unsightly and created traffic congestion. So once again, some 10,000 daily bus riders found themselves this week back at the original transfer site. City officials had promised to renovate the area into a modern-day transit mall. However, many bus riders were under the impression the renovations would be finished before the buses used the site again behind the Myriad Convention Center. Officials say the improvements are coming, but wanted to make sure money for the job was obtained first. Well, right now we've secured financing for the building of the permanent transit mall, and um, our board of directors set up that we would move as soon as financing was secure. We wanted to make sure of that. And um, so we are back really basically to the same situation on a temporary basis, only there has been a lot of extra improvements added to it. Renovation should start in October and be done by next January. The $400,000 worth of improvements will ensure this location is a permanent transfer site for buses. Oklahoma City still has a ways to go before it's known for its mass trans system, but officials say major improvements are a step in the right direction. Ed Stewart, Action 4 in downtown Oklahoma City.
500 cattle call Paul's Valley State School home. The welfare department raises the animals to help feed the school's 570 students. The butchered beef is kept in the school's commissary freezer until it's needed. A recent welfare department audit revealed that during a 30-month period, 15,000 pounds of the beef stored in the freezer failed to make it to the institution's dinner table. School superintendent Norman Smith says there's a logical explanation for the shortage. I think what we had was faulty inventory taking. I think we have faulty weights. I think we failed to uh, to ac uh, account for the, the uh, weight of the boxes, the containers, the bones, the, the waste. And uh, so if this can really mount up and it, and it can certainly give the indication of something being gone when actually we have no indication that it actually left campus. Garvin County Prosecutor Kay Huff asked the OSBI to find out where the meat went. She thinks the beef was rustled. It indicates to me there, there was really poor bookkeeping going on to have an average loss of over 500 pounds a month or uh, that someone was taking it out of the institution. And of course, uh, that large loss would in indicate to me that someone in fact had to uh, be responsible for removing it from the institution. The beef shortages have stopped since the school installed new locks on its freezers and new bookkeeping checks on its inventory. The OSBI must now decide whether the past shortages were due to human error or human greed. Scott Wallace, Action 4 at the Pauls Valley State School. This is a big moneymaker at the State Fair, the Midway. Each year, some folks walk away with prizes, others with empty wallets. These players are policemen working undercover. Tonight, they made their first inspections of the games, checking to make sure game rules and concession signs were posted properly. Each sign, each detail of the games must meet state requirements. Officers told concessionaires what needed to be changed. The concessionaires either comply or shut down. That game will be uh, closed uh, with the cooperation usually of the, uh, of the concession owner. If he knows that he's violating the law, we inform him of that, he closes the game. It's just that simple. But tonight's inspections will not be the last. Police officers in and out of uniform will continue to make spot checks on the games here to make sure that the games at the fair are really fair. Debbie Mash, Action 4 at the State Fairgrounds. Right turn heading zero one zero, departure frequency one two four point two and squawk. More planes are flying now, but the nation's air traffic system still hasn't fully recovered from last year's controller strike. Eastern seven sixty eight, you're cleared to Atlanta. Falcon zero, Charlie Golf, hold short. Uh, Immediately following last year's walkout, the National Transportation Safety Board examined the air traffic system. The board concluded the system was still safe. However, a staff investigator now claims the findings misled the public. The safety panel plans to re-examine the system. Local aviation officials say the findings of the latest investigation will be the same as the first one. We've uh, changed things very, very little. The system. Uh, was operating safely when they issued their report in early December of 1981. Uh, I have seen no compromise uh, of safety. I'm not aware of any. Uh, the system is safe. It's uh, operating normally with higher than expected traffic levels. The safety board investigators will be taking a close look at the local control facilities like Oklahoma City's Terminal Radar Approach Control Center. They'll want to find out if the strike compromised safety Supervisors at the facility say they welcome the investigation because they say the system is as safe as ever. Scott Wallace, Action 4 at Will Rogers World Airport.
Students at the Little Axe School sometimes hold Wednesday morning sharing sessions. Some parents call the meetings prayer sessions. The before school meetings have sparked a lawsuit from parents who feel their children were pressured to participate in the sessions. Attorneys for both sides agree the case is a question of constitutional rights. One thing for certain is, is that the Supreme Court has said that, that we do not allow establishment of church and state. You know, we do not allow the state to establish and assist and help a church uh, or even religion. And, and I might also say that the state of Oklahoma has a constitutional provision that is even, in my mind, stricter in terms of its wording than the, even the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. It's a matter of really a free speech case. Uh, students, uh, minor students in school are as equally protected to constitutional rights as are adults. And we also feel it's a matter of free exercise of religion, which the court has also held as uh, protected by public school students. The lawsuit hearing has been postponed several times due to a backlog of court cases. Right now it's scheduled for trial next Monday. Scott Wallace, Action 4.